Research Institute uh, which organized this event. And also I'd like to uh, recognize the support of the English Department and the Excel Studies uh, program led by Professor Asher Milbar. And of course it's a great pleasure and a great honor to sponsor this event with Lula Aragón, who was really one of the driving forces of the Cuban Research Institute, worked here for many, many years, uh, retired, but not really uh, retired uh, a few years ago, and now she uh, is writing, traveling, uh, doing a lot of uh, work, including uh, translating this book and presenting uh, a play based on, on this uh, novel, The Memory of Silence, that we also will sponsor last semester. So, uh, without further ado, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Erika May Freixas, who will now take on the uh, role of the moderating session. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Erika May Freixas. I'm Professor of Latin American Literature and Director of the FIU Translation Studies Program. On behalf of the Cuban Research Institute at this university, I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to the presentation of The Memory of Silence, a landmark novel, I think, in uh, Cuban literature and Cuban studies. Um, I feel very honored to be able to moderate this afternoon, uh, in particular because my friend and colleague, Cuba de Aragón, is a beloved author in the Cuban community on both sides of, of the ocean. Um, in part, because of her great human sensibility and the great sensibility with which he, she has dealt with the very difficult topic of Cuban history, Cuban culture, and Cuban studies and Cuban affairs. Uh, I think that many of us Cubans, because of our Spanish ancestry, uh, still have very much present in our collective consciousness the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939. My grandparents suffered uh, very much during that period. Um, thousands and thousands of Spanish emigres came to Cuba and all over the Americas. And they brought together to, uh, with them a terrible warning, which is, don't do like we did. A million dead. And what did we have to show for it? El Generalísimo Francisco Franco. That was our, uh, our great accomplishment of the Spanish Civil War after a million dead. Spanish poet Damaso Alonso called his countrymen a Cainite race, the race of Cain called a war, a fratricidal war. In, in many periods during the past 40 years, um, I have had my doubts whether my own country would suffer that same thing. And I can't tell you how many times I pray that it didn't. I think that in the, in the last few years, we have seen a lot of hope that um, that will not happen, that that terrible fate has been exercised, um, and in no small part, I think it is due because of the work of people who are professionals of culture, writers, people like Uva de Aragón. I think that a lot of her work can be described as a poetics of reconciliation. Uh, that's the same term that I use, for example, for the work of Isabel Allende, uh, in the Chilean context, the um, poetics of reconciliation. And, and I think that um, reconciliation is indeed the, uh, the greatest gift we can give to the next generation of Cubans. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists. And um, we're going to have a little bit of a presentation. I'm going to ask a couple of uh, start up warm up questions and then we're going to open the session to questions from the audience. Uh, after that we uh, will have some time to informally gather and uh, talk to uh, the um, panelists and perhaps get some books signed and, and so forth. Uva de Aragón 
Havana, 1994. I know there's a typo there, but I'm not going to correct it. <laughs> Has published a dozen books of essays, poetry, short stories, and the novel Memoria del Silencio, 2002, which now is offered in its first translation into English. A theater adaptation of the novel was presented in Caracas in the spring and summer of 2014, and in Miami in the fall of 2014. The play, Memoria del Silencio, was acclaimed by audiences and critics alike. Some of Uva's short stories and a play have also been translated and appear in textbooks and anthologies, such as The Voices of the Turtle, Cuba, A Traveler's Literary Companion, Cubana, and Cuban American Theater. She writes a column for El Nuevo Herald, which is also uh, available in her blog, uh, entitled Habanera Soy. And um, Uva, the, the, the link is uvadearagon.wordpress.com. De Aragon has merited several literary awards in the United States, Europe, and her native Cuba. Until her retirement in 2011, she was Associate Director of the Cuban Research Institute at Florida International University, where she also taught. She is a graduate of the University of Miami, where she obtained a PhD in Latin American and Spanish literature. Uva has lived in the United States since 1959. Since 1999, she visits Cuba frequently, where her work has also been included in anthologies and literary journals. The translator of the work, Jeffrey Barnett, is professor of Romance Languages and serves as Latin American and Caribbean Studies program head at Washington and Lee University. Since 1989, he has taught classes on language, culture, and literature, both domestically and abroad, including courses on the Spanish American novel of the boom, Caribbean literature, and literary translation. His articles on Spanish American narrative and comparative literary studies have appeared in journals in Spain, Latin America, and the United States. He has translated a diverse selection of Latin American authors, ranging from the short stories of Carlos Fuentes to the epic poetry of Martín del Barco Centenera. Currently, he is translating Rebaños, 2010, a volume of poetry by Cuban author Surelis López Amaya. Uva de Aragón's The Memory of Silence marks his first book-length translation. He has lived in Honduras, Mexico, and Spain. Our other panelist, Dr. Asher Milbauer, is Professor of English, Director of Graduate Studies in Literature, and Director of the Exile Studies Program at Florida International University. Prior to his current appointment at FIU, he taught in the former Soviet Union, Israel, and the University of Washington. While at FIU, he developed a number of graduate and undergraduate courses, including 20th century American and English literature, law and literature, literature and exile, Holocaust literature, and Jewish American literature. Among his publications pertaining to exile is a book on literary transplantations, entitled Transcending Exile, Conrad Nabokov, I.B. Singer. A study on exile and return, entitled Eastern Europe in American Jewish Literature, and also co-edited with Donald Watson, a collection of original essays, entitled Reading Philip Roth, as well as essays on a number of major literary figures, Vasily Grossman, Joseph Bohr, Anatoly Kuznetsov, among others. Dr. Milbauer's most recent publication, The Burdens of Inheritance, is on Nicole Krauss. Co-authored with Alan Berger, it focuses on exilic legacies and intergenerational tensions. His experiential scholarly essay, In Search of a Doorpost, Meditations on Exile and Literature, won the Sarah Russo Prize for a Best Essay on Exile. He is twice the recipient of the Excellence in Teaching Award at Florida International University. I can say that um, as a writer, as a critic, and as a translator, all three activities are definitely creative activities. 
So please uh, join me in welcoming, welcoming these three creators. Uh, first in the agenda, uh, Cuba de Aragón is going to say a few words as, a, as an opening statement. And then we're going to have some questions. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. And we're going to have uh, Professor Milbauer begin uh, with a presentation on the literature of exile and placing uh, Uva's novel in context. After that, Uva is going to uh, have a brief opening statement, then we're going to ask her some questions, then we're going to have some questions for the translator of this great work, um, uh, Jeffrey Barnett. So let's start with uh, Dr. Milbauer. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Given how much I enjoyed reading the novel, in a wonderful translation by Mr. Barnett. Uh, I plan to use every second of the 15 minutes I was allotted to speak. <laughs> this is not a threat, this is just a warning. <laughs> Let me preface my remarks by a quote from Elie Wiesel's novel, Souls on Fire. Forgetfulness lies at the root of exile, just as remembrance lies at the root of deliverance. The Memory of Silence is a rich and multifaceted novel and deals itself to a number of different approaches. My remarks will reflect my understanding of the novel as a fictional study of exile, an understanding of the, indeed, that is filtered through my personal experiences of living in a totalitarian regime and an intimate familiarity with the issues of transplantation and survival. The history of exile is the, the history of the world is the history of exile. It is a story of banishment, dislocation, transplantation. Its beginning is marked by the expulsion of Adam and Eve. Its end, however, is nowhere in sight. Although exile is a human activity that extends back to ancient times, in the modern era it has become an increasingly common experience shared by a large number of people. Facilitated by technological advancement in transportation, necessitated by centuries of warfare, political oppression, natural disasters and economic collapses, the countless occurrences of exile throughout history shape not only individuals who left one culture to begin life anew to another, but also the societies they joined and the ones they left behind. To elaborate further, the sudden influx of foreign populations indelibly alters the communities into which exile immigrants and often requires difficult adjustments for people living there. The legacy of exile is mixed. On the one hand, exile individuals commonly experienced emotional and psychological traumas resulting from their detachment from the culture, the community, and language of their birth, and sometimes from harsh receptions in their new residences. <clears throat> On the other hand, the infusion of people with new skills, perspectives, and dispositions can invigorate the receiving communities even as the new environment these communities provide can offer markedly improved opportunities for personal growth and success for exiled individuals. The price this existential tension exerts can be too high to bear, almost deadly at the time, as the following statement by Franz Newman, the famous sociologist who fled Nazi atrocities to America implies. If an intellectual has to give up his country he, has, he does more than change his residence. He has to cut himself off from historical tradition, a common experience. He has to learn a new language, has to think and experience through it. In short, to he has to create a totally new life. It is not the loss of profession, of property, of status. That alone and by itself is painful, but rather the weight of another national culture to which he can uh, to which he has to adjust himself. In his novel Victory, Joseph Conrad, the great Polish British exile writer, has one of the characters say the following I'm a transplanted being. Transplanted, I ought to call myself uprooted, an unnatural state of existence. But man is supposed to stand anything. Victor Hugo, the French writer who had a personal knowledge of exile, defines transplantation as a long dream home, of home, underscoring thus the symbiotic relationship between exile and return. The word unnatural reflects the tragedy of loss and dispossession, dispossession a curse indeed. The dream to regain a home can turn into a blessing, though, 
especially for artists and intellectuals. And yet, it is precisely this very tension of dispossession and recovery, be it physical or metaphorical, that gives rise to a creative process that allows for the transcendence of exile. The literature of exile is one of the most important is what as one of the most important forms of human activity synthesizes and particularizes the rich and often traumatic experience of transplantation and provides readers passage into the field of otherness. As one scholar put it, it has often acted as a sort of deep bridge across geographical borders, cultural mentalities, and ideological divides. And this is exactly what Professor Uva de, Arag de Aragon's novel does. It acts as a bridge across geographical borders, cultural mentalities, and ideological divides. And more, as I will explain a bit later. At the core of the most accepted definitions of exile is the experience of rejection from one's native land and implies, implies forced removal and banishment from a homeland. Viewed in, board, in broader terms, exile can assume a number of different shapes and forms, including internal exile, voluntary exile, expatriation, to name but a few, and the causes for displacement and transplantation can be political, religious, cultural, slash social, among them. The issues I have just outlined find their reflection in a number of writings my students are exposed to in my courses that treat the exilic condition. Whether they read Homer or Ovid, Isaac Bashevich Singer or Solzhenitsyn, Kundera or Cristina Garcia, Nabokov or Wiesel, James Joyce or Lahiri, they are asked to enter a world that is often beyond the imagination of young people who grow up in a democratic rather than autocratic, tyrannical or totalitarian state. They are asked to enter a world of dislocation, dispossession, uprootedness, alienation and liminality. A world where brothers kill brothers, whose sister, where sisters are separated by man-made and arbitrary restrictions, where parents cannot secure the well-being of their children, where offspring frequently defy the natural sequence of the seasons of life and die or are murdered before their parents' demise. When reading Uva's memory, memory of Silence, I could not help but think of how well her masterfully realized novel would fit into the curriculum of readings I offer my students and also about ways and approaches of teaching with this finely crafted, multifaceted, and rich narrative that, among many other things, probes and explores the complexities of the experience of exile. As a way of introduction to the novel, I would read with my students Paul Tavori's poem, The Song of Exile, a paradigm indeed of topics and themes that spell out the concerns who was characters in book when trying to transcend their unnatural state of existence. So let me just read the poem, it's very short. Exile is the emptiness, for however much you brought with you, there is far more you have left behind. Exile is the ego that shrinks, for how can you prove what you were or what you did? Exile is the erasure of pride. Exile is the escape that is often worse than the prison. Exile is the xenophobe for every single one who likes you. You'll find ten in whom there is nothing but hate. Exile is the xenatipi, nagging you for thoughts untaught and for words unspoken. Exile is the infinitive you cannot help splitting, the intention that is never equal by the execution. Exile is the invasion that can never succeed, for you can never conquer your inhibitions. It is the incubus riding the pillow. Exile is the loneliness in the middle of the crowd. Exile is the longing never to be fulfilled. It is love unrequited, the loss never replaced. The listless, loveless, long way for the train that never arrives, the plane that never gets off the ground. Exile is the end and never the beginning. Exile is the eruption whose lava stream carries you away. It is the eternity measured in minutes, the eyes that never enjoy the familiar sight, the ears that listen to alien music. Exile is a song that only the singer can hear. Exile is an illness not even death can cure, for how can you rest in a soil that did not nourish you? Exile is the warning example to those who still have their homes, who belong, but will you take heed of the warning? Loss, identity crisis, nostalgia, severance, disorder, spiritual, physical survival, paralysis of the will, impeded creativity, loneliness, and the sense of permanent transience 
permeate the conditions called exile in the poem and the novel, The Memory of Silence Alive. Both issue a strong warning not to take freedom for granted, not to be swept away by cheap and unfounded rhetoric, not to give in to false promises of an earthly paradise. The memory of silence charts the destiny of two sisters, Mencha and Lori, who indefatigably commit to paper and diary form the vicissitudes, turbulences, anxieties, and joys of their life journeys. One writes about life in Cuba and the Castro's totalitarian regime, the other about her life of exile in America, the land of promise and imperfections. Mencha becomes an architect who is unable to build a life dignified by a sense of being in charge of one's own destiny. Lori, on the other hand, manages to transcend the challenges of this location and becomes a university professor and a master of her own faith. Their respective husbands, however, become victims of unfounded and unrealized illusions. Lazar in Cuba undergoes a metamorphosis from a true believer in communism to a despondent and disillusioned alcoholic who realizes a bit too late that, that a life that a society built on their ideology of end justifying the means is a bankrupt and doomed society. Robertico, Lori's husband in America, cannot shake the burdens of the past and begin anew. Both end in suicide. Separated by 40 years, by a 40 years long period of parallel existences, the two sisters are adamant in their resolve to maintain a dialogue and bear witness to the tragedy that befell their country and their people and give testimonies to the lives under both a tyrannical regime in a country that provides a, and in a country that provides opportunity but demands assimilation and uniformity in return. They are united, however, by their love for Cuba, their homeland, by their concern for their children, by their search for love and fulfillment, and most importantly, by their desire for unification and transcendence of differences. And when finally united during two short visits, mentioned to Miami and Lori to Cuba, they, uh, they framed the beginning at the end of the novel, the sisters, after 40 years of traveling the deserts and valleys of the exilic travails, have a chance to celebrate the resiliency of the human spirit, the solidarity of friendship, and the commitment to memory and remembrance. They have finally a chance to unpack, to use Cuba's phrase, the suitcases packed with memories, honoring those who fell victim to intolerance and theological rigidity, and paying tribute to survivors who beat the odds of adversity and succeed to live a meaningful life. In the course of these brief rendezvous, the two sisters realized that the best revenge against what seems to be insurmountable difficulties caused by exile, separation, and loss is to live well. No one in the novel expresses this sentiment better than Robert, the father of Lori's deceased husband. When witnessing the depression and despondency of his prematurely widowed daughter-in-law, he admonishes her to seize the day and live. I quote, I'm speaking to you as a father would be good to his daughter, he says. You have always lived your life for others. It's time to love yourself, Lori. Travel, make a new home for yourself. Do something you have always wanted to do. Write, plant a garden, live, Lori, live it up. Uva de Aragon's novel is deeply anchored in historical circumstances that have a profound effect on her characters. Castro's revolution, the Bay of Pigs invasion, the vestiges of the Cold War, the civil rights movement in America, wars in far-flung countries like Angola and Vietnam, deeply informed the lives of the novel's protagonists and their similitude and add their similitude and credibility to the multiple storylines. Rather than being disruptive, historical facts Castro speeches, letters, archives from Bohemia and the New York Times, poems and lullabies unify the shambled and crumbling accounts of economic devastation and capitalist excesses. They provide weighty gravitas to issues all characters, be they in Cuba and America, experience when they deal with intergenerational tensions, transmissions of trauma, filial and parental obligations, and the joys and burdens of inheritance. Unique in their particularized fictional representation, the love, the lives of Uva de Aragon's characters resonate with universal implications. And this sentiment is best expressed by Lori's Crida Kerr, her passionate and heartfelt prayer she shares with her sister. She says, if I had just one wish for Cuba, 
you know what it would be? That no Cuban would ever live in exile, never mentioned, never again. Over the article's novel, The Memory of Silence, holds out the promise that Lori's prayer will be answered in not so distant a future, not only for the Cuban people, but also for many exiles forced to suffer the indignities of dispossession of Putin. To conclude, when watching the receding lights of Havana from the plane that carries her to exile, Lori comments, and I quote again, all I can see is the blinding light of Havana. It's burned into my retina. It still hurts my eyes. She repeats the same phrase as she departs from Cuba 40 years later at the end of the novel. I'm sure that upon reading and studying over the Aragon's novel, my students, like their instructor, will have her Romana Clare etched in their hearts and minds very deeply. And let me just quote from Psalm 137.4, where we read, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Well, Uwe the Aragon's novel, The Memories of Silence, is a fitting answer to this millennia-old question. Thank you. I'm listening to uh, Professor Milbauer uh, to say that I lost track of time like Christian Shandy. I'm very pleased. <laughs> um, in fact, I, I can't pass up the opportunity of, of having an expert uh, on exile literature without personally asking a question, you'll have a chance to ask questions also. And I know this is a simple question with the answer, and I'm sure uh, it, you could say volumes about, but it, briefly, uh, just to, I, I guess, uh, considering that this is something that also Uwa and, and, and Jeffrey might want to touch upon, my question is very simple. The role of catharsis in exile literature, is it achieved, is it, uh, well, how does it play out? Uh, catharsis in exile literature, it's a long, <laughs> quite a long question. <laughs> but uh, let me answer with a very brief statement. Catharsis is associated with certain epiphanies that people reach when they discover that what they hoped for is not what they are getting that they, and very often, exile literature represents a sad, uh, um, how should I put it, a sad account of settling accounts with illusions, in a way. So uh, that's the briefest of answers without belaboring the point. And uh, this, this kind of, I think, this kind of catharsis is also reflected in Uva's novel, I mentioned Lazarus, for example. He settles his accounts with illusions in a very, very tough way. And uh, he has his epiphanies throughout the novel. Uh, in another short story that comes to mind, uh, this short story is called The German Refugee by Melamut, uh, Bernard Melamut, where a German professor who is Jewish thinks of while living in Germany, he thinks of himself as a son of Germany, of the fatherland. And then he realizes, when Hitler comes to power, that that was an illusion. And uh, his catharsis, again, is associated with suicide, like in Lazarus' case. Thank you. Um, I know that uh, our topic in our little island of Cuba is really is a topic that is very much universal. Thank you very much. Uh, who is going to now uh, share some thoughts with us? Well, first I would like to thank Jorge and the Cuban Research Institute, the English Department for organizing this, and friends and colleagues and students who are here. It, it's very, and also you invited tonight to book some books, so we're going to have a reading. Uh, it's very fitting and very touching for me to be here because I wrote this novel while I was on a one semester sabbatical while I was working here. And the letter that uh, Lisandro Perez, who was then the director, wrote to the vice provost asking for me to have that um, sabbatical, um, I thought at that time that was, you know, a little too much, but it was the way of getting me the sabbatical because he was saying how successful this novel was going to be. He says, Does, don't everybody want to take time off to write a novel? 
but you know, well, I was not everyone, and he really predicted. And when I hear uh, Eric say that it's a landmark uh, novel, it, it's really way beyond what I ever expected. When I I wrote the first draft in five months, in which I didn't go out, in which I didn't talk to anybody, I just was with the characters. But when I went to present the Spanish edition in uh, Salamanca, a professor asked me, you know, how long it take to, to write it, and I thought about it, and I said, my whole life. Um, so this is a, a work that has a long history. I'm also very thankful to Jeff Barnett for having translated it, because it's given it a new life. And now my grandsons are going to be able to read it. And many Cuban Americans, many students, they've already been taught in a couple of universities. And um, I, I don't know. I'm, uh, I'm really. This, I wrote it in '99. I, I, it was published in 2002. It was. I was the first Cuban to publish an e-book. It came out in an e-book in 2010. And now, last year, we came out with the play. We are going to do it in Caracas again either this month of April. And, and then we presented the book, the, this edition at the book fair in Miami in November. And we just came back uh, last February for presenting it to the book fair in Havana. I'm not sure a lot of people have pulled that one of launching a book in the book fair in Miami and then in Havana. And it's very fitting because um, that's what it is, the ethics of reconciliation and the voices of exiles have to be heard there too, otherwise they're just talking in the vacuum um, if I, you know, don't do that. Um, so, I'll take your questions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But first let me say that I'm not prone to exaggeration. And when I say it's a landmark novel, I, I really do mean it because um, I have read a good portion, obviously not all, but a good portion of the history of Cuban literature, both written in Cuba and outside of Cuba. It's one of my fields, and I can tell you there is no other novel that approaches uh, the, the Cuban dilemma, let's call it, uh, the way that Uba's novel does. I, I really think that there's no other novel that tackles this issue square on uh, the way that she does. Uh, let me tell you by telling you that when it was first presented here at FIU, here in DC 243, mm -hmm. Rafael Rojas said the same thing. You know, so. <laughs> Good. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that, that part of the honesty uh, behind it is that there are no issues brushed under the carpet. The, the toughest issues uh, that Cuban families face are dealt with in, in, in the novel. And it, the same way that you know the, the, the two protagonists